I really have uh, to very, very much today. Uh, uh, I think uh, the last part of the day was also very exciting. Well, we have four speakers, and I would like to keep uh, the time, uh, the session on time, because two of them are leaving uh, this evening. So, uh, in order that they don't lose the, the plane, I will ask the speakers to, uh, to be on time. So, the first uh, uh, talk is by Gordon McPhee. Uh, he's uh, our president of the picture. He was uh, the, 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 the chair about uh, some weeks ago in the museum. And uh, she's going to. Good, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go through fairly quickly some of this. What I was asked to talk about was the dialogue, we, well, sorry, uh, Science and Policy and International Council for Science Pillar. Um, and I very quickly, I'll just go through it. You don't even know what the Council of Science is. It's an organization to strengthen international science for the benefit of society. And I say all societies. The vision is a long term strategic vision where the world uses science for the benefit of all, excellence, and value, etc. Uh, our three priority areas are four really but science for policy, universality of science, international research collaboration. And these things all really fit together. And they all relate to policy for science in a sense. Um, I'll come back to these. So this, first of all, research collaboration. We've been working with a whole variety of partners over decades, quite frankly, to identify and address major issues of importance for science and society, and to facilitate inter interaction among scientists across all disciplines and from all countries. So, um, universality, I just want to emphasize that it's certainly our view that all scientists, regardless of gender, race, etc., etc., are involved in this. And we do have what is called the Committee on the Freedom and Responsibility of Science, that's this one down here. And also on freedom and responsibility in the conduct of science, um, we stress freedom, but we also stress that scientists have responsibilities to actually report in a real way what they're doing not to mislead, etc., etc. So we work on those broad aspects of what we call freedom and responsibility of science. Science for policy, uh, independent authoritative advice to stimulate constructive dialogue. Uh, I regularly point out that the Council of Science is a non-governmental organization. I was just chatting with my friend here from UNESCO about that. Have you been on the World Meteorological Organization Executive Council? Uh, so you get certain politics involved in any of you and by agencies, it just naturally arises. We get politics too, but it's hopefully non-governmental as opposed to individuals and issues, those kind of things. On the science policy advice though, well, what I wanted to just mention is that at our recent International Council for Science General Assembly in Auckland, New Zealand, we had a science policy advisors meeting we had representatives of over 40 countries. We had the science advisors who report to their presidents, prime ministers, whatever, of countries like New Zealand, uh, Australia, Japan, India, China, European Union, uh, UK, France, uh, South Africa, and a few others, and probably a couple hundred people in the room. Now, the plan is to work with the OECD and possibly other partners um, to put together a series of these meetings that major events biannually, say every two years, have a big event, the kind we had in New Zealand, and a, say, what we might call workshops regularly. This kind of meeting we're having here is in a sense a workshop on a particular aspect of that science policy advice. So, we want to build this network of scientists working together with policy makers, with broad ranges of community people to better, let's say, we can work out how we can better inform uh, policy makers on the science that is relevant, and at the same time, better inform scientists how we better do and understand and translate and tr communicate the science we need for policy. Um, and I'm going to throw in a couple of examples here that. Not all science is initially driven by, uh, let's say, policy ideas. And one example is back in 
1980s, we suddenly saw this thing called the stratospheric ozone hole. And that was not expected, really, except that back in the 70s, people said, like Kutzen, Molin, Molino, and others, put together papers on the cause and identified it with CFCs. And they actually won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1995. But interestingly, you could say, well, why, you know, did that ozone hole happen every year or two? We saw it in the, you know, 1985, I think it was. But the point is that we had actually had, back to 1957, observations that had been started by the International Geophysical Year, which was sponsored by the International Council for Science. So we had put in place observing programs that showed for almost 30 years there wasn't a hole appearing every year. So it was a piece of science, and I think this kind of fundamental background science that we do, social science, natural science, is so important that we can't allow everything to be dictated by the government's needs of yesterday and today and tomorrow, but let's say do some of the other things. So we had a whole policy that came out of that, the Vienna Convention, Montreal Protocol, etc. We also had uh, direct measurements of carbon dioxide. The first measurements, again, actually were made in 1957, that same International Geophysical Year, when people put in place the first systematic measurements of carbon dioxide around the world. And so we were able to say, again, that it had gone from about 300 to 320 or so parts per million men up to the present over 400. Then, because science was put together, there was the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, and Carlos Nombre, among others, chaired at times. Uh, which actually goes back into the literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, but was able to show the past history. And again, this was science done initially because of scientific interest, wanting to understand things, and then it allows us to put in context this huge increase we've seen in the last, last well, less than 150 years. So, uh, climate change. Um, I often hear the statement that climate change is a new issue. Well, to show my age, sort of. I was a graduate student in the late 1960s, and my professor, Bob Stewart, would come back from international meetings of something called the Global Atmospheric Research Program, set up by the Council of Science and the World Meteorological Organization, which actually had this objective to understand the physical basis of climate. And he would talk about the drought in the Sahel as a climate change, possibly variation, but they were thinking back in the 60s. This is climate change we're starting to see. So this is not a new issue for scientists, but we have been looking at it, and it was interesting when I think back on it, his social science interpretations of what the response should be if you decided to say hell drought was climate change. We're pretty naive when I think about it. Nonetheless, he at least thought about it as an issue. Moving ahead, we have, that was then converted in 1980 into the World Climate Research Program with all of those sponsors, the Council of Science, the World Ecological Organization, the Oceanographic Commission, and with the responsibility, the objective of determining the predictability of climate, the effects of, and the human effects of human activities on climate. So we were starting back in 1980s to gave the scientific basis for this. And just to show you that the way these programs can work internationally is that we did a study. I was the chairman of this committee in the late 80s into the 90s, and around, I think it was around 92 or 3, somewhere in there, we got a consultant and said, can you figure out how much is this costing us to run internationally? And it was about $5 million per year international money that went through the Council of Science and co-sponsor to coordinate this project. How much research where we actually organizing, facilitating, making happen, was estimated at the order of $800 million per year. Uh, and that's because we could go, in those days, you could go to, and we'll call a meeting, and we call them contributors meeting, donor meetings, whatever, and you could get around the table the major funding agencies from all over the world to say, yeah, okay, I'll do that, I'll do that. Quite frankly, during the Cold War, we could play the Russians off against the Americans and get three more ships than you originally thought you could get. But that was politics, uh, social science in a way, coming in. Um, so 
1987, the Council of Science started the International Geophysical Year, sorry, the International <laughs> Geosphere Biosphere Program, which was really to look at those biochemical physical processes that was all involved in that. And that's what did all of those, among other things, the paleoclimate work. Uh, Carlos was on that committee. You were, were you the chairman of that one too? No, no. One, yeah, okay. You were the chairman of that one, not the, you were on the WCRP one. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, us guys, we just know each other from all kinds of funny places. We all that. Anyway, another area of, of interest was polar years. Interesting, I mean, the Council of Science, it wasn't called that in those days, but in 1882, again in 1932, 30, I should say, I'm not sure that should say, it should say 32, 33, uh, but, uh, you know, this idea of big international polar years, and in 2007, eight, we had the most recent one with, again, the Council of Science and World Meteorological Organization. And this one really was a truly interdisciplinary kind of program. Projects, I happened to chair the Canadian committee that gave out the research money, and we looked very much for interdisciplinary, looking at the social dimensions, the human dimensions in the Canadian context of the people in the Arctic. I was part of a research program then where we really looked at these interdisciplinary cross issues, cultural issues, etc. And again, this was a project that, again, was an example of how as international scientific groups we could put together, or maybe $100,000 we did the planning for, the coordination was the order of $2 million, but the whole commitment of governments was the order of a million dollars. And so you can see how the role of international science can work together, combining often in these cases, a non-governmental organization and a governmental organization, because it allows you the flexibility of working different channels of things. Um, I'm off to Japan on the uh, from this trip starting tomorrow, and uh, when I was chairman of the World Climate Research Program Science Committee, I, when I went to Japan in the 1990s or so, I consulted with my Japanese colleagues, and some days I would say, I'm from the World Climate program sponsored by the World Meteorological Organization because that could get me in to see the head of the Weather Service, the head of the Marine Agency. But if I wanted to meet the head of the Space Agency, I'd say, no, I'm from the International Council for Science. And you could kind of use that set of ownership. And UNESCO's IOC was also helpful this time. So that's another way of doing it. Okay, so we've had these programs, World Climate Research Program, IHPP. I've not mentioned Diversitas, but that was very important. Biological Diversity Program started in 91. There are two programs, I put them down here because they don't quite fit exactly, but the two programs that really build capacity, enhance capacity initially globally, and then it was decided for a variety of reasons to create one called START. International, which is for Africa and Asia, and the Inter-American Institute for the Western Hemisphere. And many of us here in this room have been part of the, inter sorry, the International, sorry, the Inter-American Institute on Global Change Research. I'm getting my acronyms mixed up. How many people have been on IAI besides me and my friends in the front row there? <laughs> anyway, this is still going on. It's a program that uh, the Secretariat has runs projects, and again, they are. We, when I was on its executive board in the 90s, we agreed that every project must have at least four countries with bona fide participants, not just place, put a name on it, pretend they're really involved. They had to be people you could show were really involved. And they're now expanding so that it's basically saying that they must be not only four countries, but also across the disciplines. So I think that's very useful. The International Human Dimensions Program started in about 96. The, in 2001, we tried to bring them all together in the Earth System Science Partnership. Another program, Integrated Research on Disaster Risk, came out in 2008. And most recently, the Urban Health and Wellbeing Program was originated. And I'll just say that the group in the circle, more or less, are now part of what we're calling Future Earth, which I'll come back to. Uh, I did want to mention, and we're, since we're talking about this, interdisciplinary things, that if you look back in the early years, this was purely natural scientists, purely natural scientists. But as we moved 
more in time, you can see it became more of a partnership of the Council of Science and the International Social Science Council. So through the last, well, three or four of the last projects are now joint projects, social science, natural sciences working together. So um, just on the question of science uh, to policy, I wanted to quickly also go through a little bit of things here. I guess you'll tell me when I'm running short. In 1985, the Council of Science, uh, with some input from UN agencies, started holding meetings. Uh, one held in Villach, Austria in 1985, chaired by Bert Bolin of Sweden, who was representing the Council of Science at that time. And they came up with this statement, many important economic and social decisions are being made today on long-term projects, all based on the assumption of past climate data, no modification, a reliable guide to the future. This is no longer a good assumption. Um, and out of that came the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Partially, and I can send you the reference when you want to see it, uh, from a colleague of mine in Canada who actually chaired the meeting in Geneva in 1988, is the feeling of some countries they didn't want that non-governmental organization, the Council of Sciences, putting out reports Let's get it under control, make it governmental. Uh, that's another issue, but uh, let me just say that the important thing was the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is intergovernmental. It's under WMO and UNEP. It's done all these science assessments. They are to policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. It's an important way of looking at things. We're not trying to tell governments to do this but say, if you do this, this is what happens. If you do that, this is what else happens, and so on. And they, importantly, as not all, sometimes not seem to be realized by government agencies or people I've heard talking, you know, leaders of government, they chatter on as though IPCC does the science. It does not do science. Deliberately does not do science. It relies on the science generated by global programs, etc. And we have to keep reminding them of that. Uh, there is more recently a program which you may not have heard of, but it's really just starting to go now, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES, which was led in its development by Diversitas and the International Human Dimensions Program. And it has objectives somewhat similar to the IPCC, but it's just starting its mandate and working ahead, and so we're looking for that. Um, the question on disaster risk reduction, where is the science assessment role? We'll come back to okay, on the next slide. So here we have in my schematic way, we have all the science from the global science community with these two major programs, plus others, feeding into the IPCC, and that feeds into the UNFCC, and we're going to have a presentation by... Anyway, later today. Um, we have the now with the new IP best, these projects and others again feeding into IP best, uh, into the Convention on Biological Diversity, <coughs> Diversity, etc. And we have now brought these together, not entirely fully, but nonetheless, the idea is that future Earth research for global sustainability will work together to bring these through and help feed into, and I'll come back to this, the science policy. Roles. Um, integrated research on disaster risk program, there is no assessment process formally right now, but there is a meeting being held in Sendai, Japan next year, next March, to create the new Yogo framework for action. Somebody talked about this earlier today. And uh, so we are having actually the Council of Science and partners, a whole bunch of them, are holding meetings now regularly to try and put in place a recommendation and possibly even a draft of what a science assessment process should be. And there's a whole flurry of meetings. I'm actually supposed to be in Paris tomorrow. <coughs> I won't be, not here. But to attend a meeting on that process. But we're trying to put together something that would be a, an agreed to recommendation to the Sendai meeting World, that's the third world conference on disaster risk reduction, how to put in place a science assessment process and some statements supporting the science to be done. So 2015 is, I, is, is 
coming year. It's a critical year for science to policy. The uh, UNFCCC will have its conference of the parties in Paris. There will be one this fall in uh, Lima. Uh, this needs to feed into it in the right way. And uh, we have been requested by the French government authorities to convene some science activities. As I've said, we'll have the World Conference on Disaster Reduction in Sendai in March, and we're working with the UN Strategy for Disaster Reduction as what is called an organizing partner on science and technology major group to feed into the prep tech conference. And again, uh, another thing that's on the that we should all be looking into, but I don't know how many people are actually involved in it, is this whole process of, since the Millennium Development Goals were all agreed to in 2000, and they are to be completed successfully or otherwise in 2015, the idea of the UN is to convert these to the Sustainable Development Goals for all countries. And I've been participating in meetings at the UN General Assembly, or well actually ECOSOC, um, in July, where we made presentations and there's now a series of meetings going on as to how does science feed into not only defining new sustainable development goals, but how do you motivate countries to actually do them and how do you actually monitor so that they can say they've actually done it or not. So much of this is said, oh yeah, we did that, but they haven't. So well, let's just say that uh, we're working on all this, the Social Science Council and the Council for Science together. And I just emphasize that in my opinion, there's many more than this, but these three policy issues, which are unfortunately dealt with, if you go back to the previous diagram, by three different sets of UN processes, the climate process, the disaster process, the sustainable development goal process, they really need to become one brought together so they reinforce each other, they're not uh, separate activities, and we need to make sure they bring in those issues of sustainable development, poverty, eradication, global security, etc. So moving right along, sustainable development, we all know what it is. Uh, one last thing, I did want to emphasize that I always look at this and say that means we need to see the future. We need to be able to project ahead. And so we have the program called Future Earth Research for Global Sustainability. Its objective is to provide the knowledge required for societies in the world to face the risk posed by global environmental change and seize the opportunities in the transition to global sustainability. And just to preface what I'm going to say in the next slide or two is that I think we need to think that global environmental change the only thing we're, we're talking about here. I think we need to, to think this through. Anyway, uh, so these are its themes, dynamic planet, global development, transformations towards sustainability, and I just raised the questions, which I've heard you talking about today. I added this little box since I've been listening to many of you during today. You know, the whole questions of social equity, poverty reduction, human rights, security, violence, international law, etc. Those are issues that probably don't yet fit in the minds of many who are looking at these three envelopes. And we need to make sure that either they're there or we find other ways of addressing them. And we need to also connect this in global process to regional and national programs, such as the things we are hearing talked to Wayne Kane about today, some of those interesting acronyms. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. You. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Julia, yeah, Julia had all these interesting acronyms uh, on uh, cosmopolitan. Anyway, well, that one. Anyway, yeah. I may be a quasi-social scientist, but I still haven't been able to really pronounce half the words. But I know realism and constructionism, constructivism. Anyway, that one. Um, as you're not aware, I have a PhD in physics, but I'm a professor of political science and geography now. <laughs> Okay, so what is the concept of future Earth, which is really different and important, and I think in a very critical way? It's this idea of what I like to emphasize, co-design. Typically scientists, and I think social scientists are the same way, you know, we design a program at some neat workshops, we bring all the scientists together, and 10 years later you conduct, you've done it over 10 years, you come back and report the results and say, here they are. Aren't you happy? To all the stakeholders. 
What we're trying to do here is to create a co-design program <coughs> where the, the stakeholder groups to what we're calling an engagement committee, which is now in the process of being set up, and help to design the science program. What is it we actually need to study and why? And how would you modify it based on that stakeholder input? We want to have that co-production, so it is, as they're using the words, transdisciplinary, stakeholder involvement, et cetera, et cetera. And when we get the results, as they will come out continuously, a co-delivery, so it's not just scientists standing up at meetings and, and blathering on about something, but we actually have a process of delivering these results to the communities that we need. And there needs to be that stakeholder academic involvement together throughout. We want to use opportunities like assessment and convention processes, the SDS forum that I'll be at next week in, uh, in Kyoto, national, regional, international conferences, etc., etc. And that will be what we want to do as science for policy. So I wanted to mention very quickly two other projects which are not part of Future Earth, but we need to make sure they are linked, otherwise we're going to end up in problems. Integrated research on disaster risk is it has its objectives. What are the hazards, vulnerability, and risk by necessity interdisciplinary? How do you make have effective decision making? Whether that's the individual who in Canada when they you put out a tornado alert, it seems, of course, from what you sell, see on television that half the parents run out, stick the kids on the back porch, get the movie camera going so they can be on national television of their kids being exposed as this tornado comes rolling up behind them. I want those people arrested, but they do it every time we have a tornado. You see somebody on television doing that. Anyway, but it's also effective decision made right up to the global governmental levels, national and global. And how do you actually reduce risk, curb losses, some specifics? So that project is underway with the sponsorship of the Social Science Council, the UN, and the Council of Science. We also have a new program called Health and Well-Being in a Changing Urban Environment, a systems analysis approach sponsored by the Council of Science with the Inter Academy Medical Panel. Again, this is, we'll try and follow that diagram, but it's the only one I could find. It's this complexity of a urban environment, health, social issues, etc. is what they're addressing. They're just starting. It's a brand new program. The International Program Office will open in China in December. So, just to end, um, I think we need to address, as I say, the issues of intergenerational and international equity for the health of the people on the planet, science for policy, policy for science, and if you haven't seen these characters, that's my grandson, my two of my granddaughters, my daughter, her husband, that's my arm in there, but I knew you didn't want to see me. And I can only assume my other granddaughter must have been standing with my wife taking the picture, because I can't find her in that I couldn't find one of them all in. And these are grandchildren of somebody else on our planet. And so we need to do it for, as I once said when I was briefing our federal cabinet in Canada, when they said to me, what on earth do you want us to do this, this, and this, and nothing will happen between now and the next election? Why would we do that? And I said, do it for your grandchildren or children. And my two, I only had two grandchildren then, but they appeared on the front page of the national newspaper when I told that story. <laughs> uh, my daughter got remarried, so she doubled the number of grandkids overnight. <laughs> anyway, thank you for your attention. PCC first, and then I'm going to move to the UNFCCC, and then some uh, concluding remarks from, from my side, and hopefully it could be food for thought for, for the work of ICSU in the, in the near future. So, um, so let me start then by, by bringing some results from the IPCC AR5, the assessment report number five of the IPCC, and it, it, I, I, I'm sure you, you know this information, but it's good to all, always to, to uh, recall this, these figures and, and these numbers. This is, this is um, emissions of CO2 from 1750, so prior to the Industrial Revolution to the present. And you can see here for different, in the, in the left panel, uh, these emissions from different regions in the world. 
and in the, the right panel, this is cumulative emissions. So this is the, ag the, the aggregate numbers from 1750 to 1970 to 1990, and then the last bar on the right side is uh, from 1750 to 2010. So you can see here uh, the flow of, of emissions in the, in the left and, and, the, and the cumulative emissions on the right, and the, the different regions, as I said. So uh, it's important to, I, I, I want you to recall that the shape of the, of the lines on the left panel, because we will see something, uh, and I want, uh, in the in few minutes, that I want to relate to that. Uh, then, other ways to look at these emissions, different perspective have taken by, by the IPCC. Here is, uh, the, the, again, greenhouse gas emissions, but, but just for the last uh, 40 years, four decades, and, and this is uh, uh, per region as well. And then on the right panel, you have uh, per capita emissions, a different, a different perspective. And then, and then you see uh, how the different regions differentiate from, from the others. Um, so another perspective is emissions by group of gases. Again, here we can see as an important feature of this figure in particular is that the last decade, at least from 2000 to 2010, the growth in emissions was larger than in the previous three decades. This is the number, the small number that you have on top, on the top. And, and of course, CO2 dominates the scene here. So, uh, again, one, one of the perspectives that the I, I, IPCC uh, has taken on, on, on emissions. And, and the last one here is emissions by sectors. Here again, you have energy, uh, industry and transport dominate in the scene again and of course that is related to, to the combustion of fossil fuels and then in green the, 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 the bottom uh, area is, is emissions coming from uh, land use and land use change basically deforestation that is what we're talking about deforestation so uh, this is what we have now uh, this is uh, this increase in emission flows is despite of the, of the efforts being made at international level and, and at national level as well. So the, the scenario is, is is pretty worrisome. So uh, this is this is what we have. The IPCC in, the, in this late uh, report uh, sort of look for a solution space for that, uh, for this issue. And, and then look first at the uh, possible emission pathways from from now, or from 2000 to, to 2100, at the end of the century. And the different scenarios are shown here in this figure, in different colors. The only one that leads us to a reasonable future, meaning keeping the, the temperature of the, of the planet below two degrees increase with respect to the to the pre-industrial uh, temperature is the, the scenario in blue at the very bottom. Among all these scenarios, the only one, everything, the only one that leads us to a reasonable future is the one in the future. That is the, 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 the pathway that the mission should should follow if we want to have something decent by mid-century or at the end of the century. And how to achieve that? How to achieve this, this uh, scenario, uh, which is a scenario that it has different names, but in terms of uh, concentration of greenhouse gas emission, it should go between 430 and 4, 480 part uh, ppm uh, of CO2 equivalent. But this is what the IPCC says in their report. Basically, uh, there is a, a need for a transformation required mainly in the energy sector, and it recommends or tells about a couple of things, a more rapid improvement of energy efficiency, and then a, a number of uh, energy or technologies uh, to be implemented in the near future. Renewables, it talks about nuclear energy, and it also talks about kind of a crazy things, like uh, carbon capture and storage. I will tell you that about that if you're interested. But uh, these are the kind of uh, solution that the IPCC is proposing in the, in the report. But I have to say something about this. This is another, another way to see this. 
uh, this is uh, depending on the scenario that you want to be, then this the, the amount of, of low carbon energy share of primary of primary energy should uh, should have. So so this is a little bit complicated figure it comes from the IPCC report, but uh, again it shows the tremendous amount of uh, of effort that it needs to be done in particular in the energy sector again energy including transportation as well how to bridge the gap at least from a technological point of view and again this is a figure that you usually see everywhere this comes not from the IPCC uh, I, I bring in this from the from a UNEP report uh, it, it is clearer than than the other one from the IPCC but it shows that all the technology uh, possibilities that you, you may have in different sectors, power sector, industry, transport, uh, buildings, waste, forestry, agriculture, all the technological improvement that you can get in all these sectors to bring the missions that should, that could follow the, 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 the dash line to the top, back or down to the, the emissions that will keep the global temperature at a decent level. So, but this is again the technological approach that in my view, and I was part of this report, but I have to say that unfortunately this is the, the solution space that the IPCC mainly follow for, uh, to reach this, this scenario, the two degrees scenario. Uh, but, Someone's knocking at your door. <laughs> okay, someone wants to get in. Uh, drivers, uh, when you look at drivers of emissions, uh, you s you start seeing uh, what, what I'm what I'm saying. Uh, we can. What are the drivers of for, for emissions? We in the, in the IPCC report, what we did is just to to look for what we call the immediate drivers. These are factors that influence the emissions directly. And these are four main. In, in particular when we talk about energy. But since energy is the, is the most important sector, then, then these four drivers are key. And one is population. The other one is the, the GDP per capita. Third one is energy intensity of production. So how much energy you use to produce one unit of GDP. And finally, the emissions the carbon emissions or the, the GAG emissions in your energy mix. So these are for immediate drivers. These uh, influence the emissions almost directly. And when you look at these four drivers and how they evolve in the last 40 years, you see first the, uh, the CO2 emissions per unit of energy. How how much dirty is your energy mix? And you can see that in 1970, you start on these, these factors starting one, and four decades later, <coughs> continue almost at the same level. So we have not changed the kind of energy resources that we are using globally. When you look at the second factor, this is the energy intensity, how much energy you use to produce, how efficient you are for producing goods and services. And we're, we were good in the last four decades. If you look at the, the, this second line now, we move from one to, let's say, 0 0.6. This is very good. We are using less energy to produce one unit uh, of GDP. Let us look at the third factor, or the, the third driver, immediate driver. And this is the GDP per capita. And this is related fundamentally to consumption, consumption of goods and services. And this moved from one in 1970 to two in, in 2010. These, these are actual data at a global level. This is actual data coming from all countries in the world and aggregated to, to create these global figures. The fourth um, factor, population, and this is straight line, 
going from 1 to let's say 1.8, something close to that. So these are the four factors. If you now multiply the four factors, what you get is the, the emissions of greenhouse gases. And this is the last line I want to show. And this is this goes from 1 to 2.2 something close to that. And this is interesting. It, it comes to my mind immediately the following. We were doing good in terms of the consumption of, of energy to produce one unit of GDP. Again, this is very much related to your efficiency in producing goods and services. It's very much related to the technological uh, improvement that, that you can you can have, but even that, even if we were good at that, we cannot overcome the increase in consumptions of goods and services related to the GDP program. So this is an interesting story. I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes. So in addition to this immediate driver, there are other drivers. We call it in the IPCC underlying drivers. <laughs> and these are mainly other issues like uh, fossil fuels and dopant and, uh, and availability that you may have in your country. So consumption patterns in different regions, different countries, within countries, different consumption patterns within social classes within countries, A structural and technological changes and choices. And of, and of course, behavioral choices at a personal level and a social level. So these are underlying drivers. These drivers are subject to policy. And through policies that can, can modify or alter these drivers, you can, in turn, alter the immediate drivers that, that uh, modify emissions. These are much more difficult to assess in a, in a quantitative terms, much more complicated. The other ones are numbers. You can you can collect those numbers, put the figures in there, multiply, divide, and etc. And you can get it. these are much more difficult. Actually, the IPCC doesn't get into the quant quantification of the of the influence of these drivers. Just address it addresses these drivers, but in a, in a qualitative term. So. Now let us go quickly through the negotiations on technology and the, the UNFCCC. And then after going through this quickly, I'm going to join the two things, IPCC, UNFCCC. So what's going on in the, the UNFCCC? You know that the, the, this convention has some, some uh, provisions for uh, technology development and transfer. Developed countries are supposed to help developing countries uh, on technology issues. And, and the discussion has been going on for, for years and years until 2010, when finally the technology mechanism was established under the UNFCCC. And this is to facilitate this technology development and transfer. This is how it looks like. <laughs> this technology mechanism, mechanism depends directly from the conference of the parties, the COP. And it has two branches, two pillars. One is the Technology Executive Committee that mainly gives policy recommendations to the COP on this particular matter, technology development and transfer. And the other pillar is the CTCN, the Climate Technology Center and Network. And this is to provide services, te <coughs> technical assistance to parties to the convention through what we call the NDEs, which are the national designated entities. And of course, then there is a network, a network of institutions. This network is being built up now as we speak. So this is how the, the, the technology mechanism looks like. It's, it's up and running now. It, it, it's, it's quite new. It has two years. So for, for in, in UN terms, that is really very, very little, very short time. But it's working. And it has, it has, in my view, I'm part of that from the very beginning and, and negotiated this thing 
I'm, I'm the chair of the tech now, and, and so I'm, I'm very much involved in this, and I have to say that it has some potential. It will depend, but it has some potential to deliver actual things on the ground. Uh, however, there are different perspectives uh, in the UNFCCC uh, around this, this issue, around technology, around technology development and transfer. And, and we have, of course, one vision about that, that says that what, what, what is needed is developing countries to create an enabling environment. And then the private sector can jump in to developing countries and bring new technologies, etc. That is the way that technology is, is, is transferred to developing countries. So of course, this is, this is advocated by developed countries, this vision. The, the other vision is a more comprehensive one, at least in my view, and it considers that every step in the technology cycle, from research, development, demonstration, all the way to commercialization, etc., are equally important. So all these stages should be considered. So this is, of course, the vision advocated by developing countries. So, okay, one vision is about pool factors. So you create the negative environment, and this will pull the technologies to your country. Of course, that this approach is not going to be enough, because there are many uh, stages in the technology cycle that cannot be covered by, by the private sector. And also, some technologies that will not be covered by this sector, by, by private sector. For instance, as it says there, technologies for adaptation, adaptation to climate change. These are not commercial technologies, usually, and they are very much needed in many countries. So, uh, what the developing countries are asking for is push factor. So, they are asking developed countries to push for private, push the private sector to come and push for for financial support uh, for these kind of activities that are not the part of the, the private initiative at all. So. In the end, the technology mechanism created or established a couple of years ago is to promote this more balanced approach where pull and push factors are equally important and public and private sector have distinctly by key roles to play in all this. So this is a little bit just in a nutshell what, what's going on about technology in the, in the UNFCCC. However, let me now bring the two issues together. What, what happened in the IPCC and what is going on in the UNFCCC is basically the same. Both IPCC and UNFCCC are looking at economic and technological solutions to climate change. I have to admit that there are exceptions to this, and it's important to mention. I have to say that some parties are not looking only at technology and economic solutions to climate change. And I have to mention Bolivia, for instance. I have to mention India. They are looking at different issues around technology and around climate change in general. But climate change, as we know, is just an emerging, the tip of an iceberg, as I put it there in the, in the screen, of an iceberg of much deep problems, social, environmental, economic problems, as, as we know. And let me uh, bring a little bit of history. And we all know this, but it, it's always good to remember. The challenge we face now is not technological. It's, a, it's, it's anchoring the current paradigm of unlimited economic growth, as we all know. We believe that we can grow forever. And every time this growth is, is, is bumps down, then we are very much concerned like the crisis in 2008. And of course, it's based also in this idea of unlimited natural resources. And these ideas have, has a philosophical basis on these people that are named on this on the screen right now. Francis Bacon, Descartes, Newton, Locke, Adam Smith, of course. And these ideas was, were possible mainly for the discovery, exploitation, and use of fossil fuels. And if you don't believe that, 
let me just show you this figure that shows the evolution of the energy resources, primary energy resources, again, from the Industrial Revolution to the present. And, and now, please remember the figure that we, see, we saw at the very beginning with the evolution of the, of the uh, CO2 emissions. And remember the shape of that figure, and, and now look at the shape of this figure. So, but uh, this, these ideas of limited growth, unlimited uh, resources, etc., have led to assess human activities only in terms of economic cost and benefits. And I have to say that from the very beginning, see, even before the Industrial Revolution, economists and engineers have, have completely forgotten about environmental uh, issues, about the limits our planet, uh, about imposing uh, on us, uh, about the, the limit of the natural cycles uh, of the planet. There is a need for integration, and this is my final my final uh, section of this of this presentation, and this is uh, what I believe would be to be good for thought for the. For, for each. Come on in. Uh, yeah. So there is a need to begin uh, a transition to sustainable way of producing goods and services. And this, uh, this new approach uh, should measure and evaluate activities in a different way. And this new approach should integrate economic, social, and, and, and environmental and political dimensions, uh, all dimensions of sustainability. So there is a, a clear need for that. We cannot continue with the with the idea that economics will will do it all and will measure uh, all our activities and assess all our activities. So in this sense, let me say that uh, there are good news, and the good news is that new methodologies are now emerging. Uh, these methodologies have a moralistic approach uh, to assess our activities. And I can give some examples, and, and you can see on the screen ecological footprints, integrated balances for, for companies and firms, uh, multi criteria analysis, and, 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 and there are some more. And, and these methodologies bring together different criteria uh, for different dimensions in a way that you can even aggregate and, and and then analyze it in that way. However, there is a need for reaching out. And again, this is something that ICSU can take care of. And we need to reach, to reach out policymakers. We need to reach out to private sector, companies, firms, etc., the media, and people, the, the, the general audience. So there is a need for that. And I, I could include there, of course, the academic community or the scientific community. Uh, and finally, uh, of course, this this approach is, is part of it. Should be part of a new paradigm uh, where we can start looking at, at society, uh, nature uh, as an indivisible whole, as it says in the in the screen. And again, uh, I want to thank you. I'm happy to take comment or question later on. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I, when I saw the program, I, I thought what I could bring to this very illustrious uh, conference that would add to the discussions. And I decided to talk a little bit about the Amazon, which is very close to my heart and also to interests of Latin America, the Amazonian country in particular. And uh, to give a few examples on uh, challenges to bring sustainability to development, uh, but of course I'm a natural scientist. I don't. I'm still far from Gordon McBean's crossing the bridge to become a social scientist. I, I don't claim that. And so, of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, not social science per se, but on science policy interface. A few examples, good and not so good uh, successes 
in Brazil related to the Amazon. But again, uh, I'm sure uh, you're going to get out of this <laughs> talk knowing that I'm a, I'm a natural scientist. Uh, so, uh, of course, so we are concerned about the future of the Amazon. In fact, Ixus flagship project, as Professor McBean very well pointed out, is Future Earth, one of the flagship projects, but a very important one. So, we are concerned about the future Amazon. What's the destiny, the fate of this very important uh, system? collection of very diverse ecosystems, a lot, lots of cultural, ethnic diversity. It's a very important element, not only for our countries, but for, for the planet and for sustainability. So I will deal a little bit with that issue here. Uh, the concept of the Anthrop Anthropocene has been already mentioned a number of times in here. and. Uh, this is a realization of that concept and the, the natural consequence of the driver of the Anthropocene, which is the great acceleration, meaning this rapid transformation in economic systems post -war, World War II uh, that led to a tremendous increase in use of natural resources, population growth energy consumption, food consumption, deforestation, land use change, and you name it. Well, of course, this is a realization for the Amazon. And uh, perhaps the one difference to note is that the Amazon Great Acceleration started a couple of decades later. It did not start in the 50s. It started really for good in the 70s. But it really picked up steam and uh, that the land is being transformed in a very, very rapid pace. So, basic all concerns that the Anthropocene, globally speaking, we have those concerns for the region of the planet, the Amazon. And uh, I'm, I'm going to, to talk a little bit on the consequence of that, particularly for the maintenance of the tropical ecosystems in the Amazon. But perhaps the lessons for the Amazon are valid for all tropical forests of the planet. So let me start by saying risks to the natural system in Amazonia. So does the great acceleration globally and regionally pose a risk to the ecosystems of Amazonia? Can they disappear? Are they running the risk of being extinct, degraded, uh, biological diversity erosion, climate uh, ecosystem services, climate stability, hydrological stability, etc., etc., etc. So that's, I'm going to start looking at that. But we're on a very top-down approach, which is, let's say, modeling. Modeling, usually, uh, it goes without saying that if we want to project uh, the future, we need to have some understanding of these several components of the Earth system interact, and if you have a good understanding of that interaction, perhaps you can project <coughs> into the future and get some ideas about the future. This is part of a, a, a work we've been doing for perhaps 15, 20 years in Brazil, which is try to project what's going on, what can happen in the Amazon. This is, is a partic particularly a simple model that relates vegetation to climate. It's a climate vegetation model. Uh, green is forest, pink is savanna. So you see the, the, the Amazon on the top and then the Central, the Central American savannas. All these other boxes are scenarios if you uh, change climate. This is only climate change, only if you perturb climate. And those are IPCC scenarios previous generation, the fourth assessment report. And that basically, visually, you can see that the, the forest is pushed to the northwest. And if you look at uh, in terms of, and why to use all those many climate change scenarios? Because basically the models contain 
certain intermodal variability, one might call uncertainty. So the models do not predict exactly the same climate for the future. So you use all of them and get a, a, a probabilistic sense out of those. But if you look uh, all those models all together, basically it shows a tendency to more savannas, so basically the forest retreats to the northwest near the Andes, and that's the reason is that near the Andes a lot of rain, and the Andes cause the rain, so the Andes are, are not going to change, so the forest retreats and the, and the savannas take over uh, about uh, 20 and, uh, and uh, almost 50% before the end of the century. So, but this is a simple model. Now we have made many much better models, much more sophisticated. They are called Earth system models because they have many more elements, more realism, and more complexity. So basically, this is similar to that one uh, forest savannas, but here. We look at combined effects, climate change, the IPCC fifth assessment report, scenarios, deforestation, fire, and the so-called CO2 fertilization. The red means usually this if effect is detrimental to the forest, and the green means it's it's good for the forest. CO2 means more CO2 in the atmosphere, plants like CO2, they grow better, they use more efficiently water. And then there are, this is a summary, there's a lot of possibilities. 20% is pretty much the deforestation today, all over the Amazon, and, and the expanding deforestation of 50. Fire means savanna vegetation uh, is adapted to fire. So to have a savanna vegetation like Central South America, you need fire. So forests don't like fire. Fire is detrimental, fire extincts forests. Tropical forests, uh, tropical rainforests, wet forests. So, and, uh, and again, the, oh, sorry. Uh, basically, and this is the most extreme IPCC uh, fifth assessment report scenario. This is pretty much a scenario, so called RCP 8.5, 8.5 watts per meter square by. 2100 means basically if you continue what my uh, previous speaker mentioned, those trends of emissions, if they continue unchecked, that's pretty much what you get by the end of the century. Basically, you get something not very different, so the forest is pushed to here. This is seasonal dry forest, and the savannas move, uh, take between. Uh, I can show you the end result of that. This is a uh, project. Uh, this is remaining forest in many, many of these scenarios with this earth system model. And basically, just to get one 20% deforestation, climate change of all those nine earth system models, the effect of fire, the effect of CO2 fertilization, all are factored in for those true three IPCC scenarios, 2.6, 0.45, you get this, basically a reduction of forest by 50%. So this is pretty much, I would say, although with lots of still unknown and uncertainty, this is state of the art projection, what might happen to the Amazon forest in the future, forced by all these factors. A very important element to know whether the forest will turn into savanna or not is the length of the dry season. If you have a very short dry season, forests evolved over hundreds of mean, tropical forests, millions of years on a wet environment. They are not used to dry soils. So they need water, they need to transpire water year-round. So if the, and savannas, on the contrary, they go very well with six months dry season. So this is a very marked change those two biomes. So basically what some of these modeling, and I'm going to show you results as well, observations, are indicating is that uh, if you have a combination of deforestation, by 2020 it is not far 
and fire, you may increase the length of the dry season in many areas of the Amazon. This is again a modeling result, just showing some sensitivity. You are playing with a very important element to savannization, to transform to savannas. Let me show you some data here. This is meteorological data from this area of transition between the Amazon and uh, savannas, the uh, tropical forest. This all our deforestation, this red, uh, heavily deforested areas. Basically, what this brackish, this is rainfall, it's mostly uh, the spring rain. The onset of the rainy season here is showing a trend, trend statistically significant uh, of decline. Is this a local effect of deforestation? Deforestation making drier dry seasons, de delaying the onset of the rainy season. Is this an effect of global warming? We don't know. But we are starting to see, perhaps, in this tentative conclusion, uh, lengthening of the dry season, which will be a clear indicator of savannization. This is a, another way of looking for uh, climatologists. This is very easy to understand. For non-climatologists, sometimes it's not easy to understand, but basically this is time. It's a time uh, section. Uh, and this is one area that's uh, Amazon, Brazil and Amazon, uh, and this is month of the year. This is millimeters of rain per month. So 100 millimeters means wet season, dry season. More than 100 millimeters a month, this is arbitrarily set, but it's pretty much what you observe. So basically, what this is showing, if you look from the 50, 51, to 2010 is that the 100 millimeter a month line is shifting towards October, from September to October. If this is pro proven to be true, basically means a large chunk of the Amazon is becoming not necessarily drier year round, but the dry season is becoming longer, which is another indicator, a very important indicator. So I just want to give you two pieces of information uh, on observations perhaps supporting that. Let me give you this, di this cartoon to illustrate what's going on here. Uh, a lot of theoretical work and modeling work has indicated the possibility of the Amazon vegetation climate to have two stable, stable states. One is uh, only a forest cover Amazon, so you perturb that state, this is illustration, it's, it's stable. You, you push this, this ball, and it will uh, bounce a little bit back and forth and then come back here. This is stable equilibrium. However, it's been shown that there may be a second equilibrium with savannas. So it's a forest and savanna second, a, a equilibrium state. And fire and the longer dry season make this second point very, very stable meaning you cannot move it back to a forest state. Uh, so basically, many other studies, I'm summing up here, many, many studies, are indicating that you, you may switch from this one to this one if, good, if Amazonian temperatures is higher than 3.5 degrees, or deforestation is larger than 40% of the total forest area. How are we Today, we are about one degree, this is global warming, a little bit of deforestation, deforestation works out, works out the, the, the tropics, and deforestation is 20%, and as I showed before, it seems that we are starting to see a lengthening of the dry season. So I might say that we are playing, you know, basically pushing this thing here, and eventually we are going to push it over, and then, and that becomes a, inevitable, unavoidable uh, move to uh, uh, forest and savanna states. Uh, is this thing, how likely is this thing to happen? So let me uh, 
show that large areas of the Amazon forest are degraded by logging and fire. So if you go look at selective log logging, you start seeing a degradation, thinning of the forest. And then really after a few decades, a couple of decades, 15 to 20 years, you end up with this very, very uh, degraded forest. This is pretty much vulnerable to becoming a savanna uh, in the future. I, I show you a very interesting uh, experiment in, the, in, a, in a frontier uh, border between forests and uh, agriculture in, in southern Amazon. You can see there, the position there, the location. An experiment on savannization. Basically, what this group did was to set fire repeatedly on that transition forest. And uh, the final result was very interesting and uh, worrisome. Basically, cumulative tree mortality increased quite a lot compared to control. So this control uh, over time shows also increase, but that's because of extended droughts. And then we, we, when you do that experiment of using fire, you basically increase tree mortality tremendously. And the savanna tree species are tolerant to fire, so they will survive. So basically this is one type of prescribed uh, fire experiment to demonstrate whether savannization is likely or not. I, I'm becoming convinced savannization is something very likely to happen. So this is the final uh, look of that area Repeatedly, uh, repeatedly affected by fire. Uh, okay, let me switch gears a little bit and ask the question whether we are seeing in the Amazon. Yeah, in the Amazon, in the last 10 years, 2005 2014, we have had five record breaking events two massive droughts, 2005 and 10, and three massive floods. This in comparison to 112 years of data. We have good data. However, when we look at 500 years of tree ring data from Southern Amazon, we don't see extremes like that. So at least 500 years. At least 500 years. So what's going on? Is this, ex is this natural variability? Probabilistically speaking, would be very small, very marginal probability of having five extremes in a 112 year record. Uh, so it's it's good to ask uh, whether this is just a manifestation of natural variability or could be an early sign of climate change due to global warming. Uh, let's hear what IPCC okay before that in the in the in the first half of this year we have this massive flood in Southwestern Amazon for hydrologists, you understand this, this is the water level uh, throughout the year. And this is 2014. I just want to highlight it just the peak flow was 65,000 cubic meters per second. The Amazon flow is 220. This was tremendous. You can see close to the next maximum peak in 1997. So this is Tremendous amount of water caused a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, rip, rip havoc in, in the life of millions of people there. But what I want to highlight really is whether we are seeing, starting to see uh, early signs of climate change due to global warming. So let's see what IPCC has to say. IPCC, looking at all these uh, extremes, concluded. With medium confidence, if you want to read the IPCC jargon, which is some confidence, it's not strong confidence, but probably this is one of the few things IPCC said for Latin America with medium confidence, it's more likely to be due to global warming than not to be due to global warming. Just something happening, happening, happening naturally. So this is a very important information. Perhaps we are seeing, in fact, early signs of global change. Now, the second part of my talk, the science policy interface for reducing deforestation. 
uh, I just want to say uh, this is well known. It was this data was released last week by the Global Carbon Project. Uh, Professor McLean did not mention that, but this project is a direct result of IGBP, WCRP, uh, and it's part of it's going to be part of future work. And and they are doing a very valuable uh, budget, carbon budget globally, not only fossil fuel and other emissions, but also land use change. There are two good news here, and one, of course, very bad news and. Uh, my predecessor here mentioned the bad news. Let me tell you the good news. The good news is that land use change, uh, you see here, billions of tons of, of CO2 per year, and this is CO2 carbon, this is not CO2 equivalent. This is only the carbon part of greenhouse gases. G sorry, it's only the CO2 part of greenhouse gases. Basically, uh, land use change this is Amazon, Central America Africa and Southeast Asia is declining it was 36% of total emissions in 1960s uh, 19 in 1990s only 80% but one might say well but it's 80% because fossil fuel emissions increased tremendously it's still very high, no it's not very high Look at the curve, it's declining. Perhaps showing some stability in the last few years. Uh, you're going to, I'm going to show Brazil has a lot to do with this decline, but this is really good news. The percent wise is declining, but also the total amount. The, the atmosphere does not care about percents, it's only care about the amount of CO2 and other greenhouse gas in the doing extra warming to the lower atmosphere. So basically this is very good news. And I will tell you a little bit how Brazil did it. I think others uh, need to understand how that is taking place in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in Central America. But the trend is not only Brazil. The trend is more global, although in Brazil was very accurate. The bad news is that this is going up and up. Uh, just let me tell you why the implications of the bad news. And of course, many, many people are very hopeful that eventually there will be ways of turning, inflecting that curve down. For two degrees, it seems to be quite a challenge. Uh, but if you keep that trend, so three to four degrees warming by 2100 is inevitable. For, so for the Amazon and for the other tropical forests, what does that mean? That means that even if you reduce, and you've seen the pledge of 23 countries last week in New York, the forest declaration, to zero deforestation by 2030. So let's say everyone does, and they accomplish by 2030, it's zero net deforestation, zero emissions from land use change, and it's not only tropical because the US, Canada, if I'm not mistaken, also pledged, and, 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 and uh, Russia and others, and tropical countries as well, but still, this thing will eventually kill all the forests. So one risk, tropical countries may have or can have policies to address. The other risk, tropical countries can do better than you talk about. I think that also poses a very important question for social science. The controls, the policy controls a country, tropical country may or may not have. And how the, the country will respond to that. Sometimes I'm very afraid, even in Brazil, and I will tell you now this success story, that eventually people say, okay, forget it, let's throw the towel. We can't help it, because the other curve is going on. Uh, so, these are some scenarios. This is current deforestation pattern. Uh, this is uh, sustainability, uh, which demands a lot of challenges to be met. Uh, 
if we want to read this, basically it's all identical means turning the forestation in Brazil to almost zero in the tropical forests. Uh, but this is a fragmentation scenario in which policies are loose and uh, agriculture expands without control into the Amazon, traditional agriculture, and then we are going to get about 50% deforestation by 2050. So, of course, government policy in Brazil is this one, government policy. However, it's very difficult to achieve that. Uh, policy to reduce Amazon deforestation, I think Brazil has been very successful. This is the deforestation rates from 1988 in which we have had very good satellite uh, monitoring, satellite-based monitoring systems. And uh, so you see ups and downs. This, this before this downturn, you could almost see a, a very close coupling between economics and the deforestation. Commodity, commodity price, soy, beef, went up, peaks of deforestation. So, the, the system, although at a minimum economic efficiency, was coupled to the economics, the basic commodity economics. Uh, now it's completely decoupled. Uh, output, agricultural output of the Amazon is increasing much faster than GDP in Brazil, much faster than agricultural outcome from other parts of Brazil and the deforestation. This is a very good example that land use change can be decoupled. And this is not theory, I'm showing you data. Uh, basically, that policy was driven by these two major policy uh, actions by Brazil 2004, the program to control deforestation, 2008, also focus effort to target uh, municipalities with very high rates of deforestation. Let me, okay, this is very successful. This is pretty much command and control. It's mostly about curbing illegal deforestation, which is by and large 80-90% of deforestation, which historically was illegal. Uh, it succeeded. And uh, I just want to highlight, because this is about science, policy, uh, innovative technology. This is satellite-based systems developed by Brazilian Institute for Space Research, uh, pioneered these technologies in the 70s, 80s. Technology is very important, uh, of course, but this technology has been in, uh, in use or, or actually available, this data, from 1988 on, but only started being used in 2004, five on. So technology is, is a must, it's a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient if there is no political will to make the data transparent and to make the data effective mm -hmm. in the policy. But after starting 2004 5, this is the main guide for policy. This is a yearly uh, map. They want to show just how the data is used. This is for 2011. So the analysis goes to land site resolution, very high resolution. So you have small patches of deforestation, about seven hectares detected. And then it's monitored every county, every municipality rates going down, going up. And then there's a lot of focal, focalized policies to reduce deforestation in area hotspots. So this is working. This is working at least to come down from 27,000 per month a year to about 6,000. 6,000 is still a lot, but it's a tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, progress. This is coupled to another uh, system, and uh, which is called the DIRT, uh, also by the Brazilian Research uh, Space Research Institute. Which the DIRT is based. Uh, it's a fast. Uh, response detection system based on the mode sensors, moderate resolution, not high resolution, but it detects daily uh, deforestation. So this data is related to the, to 
the uh, law enforcement agencies all over the Amazon, and they use this data to to enforce the law, basically to curb uh, illegal deforestation. This is also very useful. So the combination of these two, the, the protest data on a yearly basis to, to, to drive the main policies of, of curbing illegal deforestation, and this one to keep uh, information for law enforcement at, at the spot. So those are very important elements, how science, how in innovative technology is contributing to Brazil. A second uh, element of this policy, government policy, which is implemented right now, I cannot show you results, but I think this is very important to start to bring here because it cuts across the main element. We need food, we need food security. Brazil is seen as a country contributing figures vary 20 to 50 percent of the extra food necessary to feed the world by 2050 because it has water, it has land. But of course, as shown by Professor Bigelli, Brazilian emissions are changing. Now they are becoming more related to energy and agriculture. So this is a program which is also part of Brazilian policy to reduce emissions uh, that uses science developed, applied science by the Brazilian agricultural research company in Rapa. In many areas, you can see the integrated crop, livestock systems, agro systems, re restoration of degraded pastures, biological uh, fixation of nitrogen, planted forest, no till planting, and I don't know if you can see the figures here, but there are, for instance, restoration of degraded pastures, 15 million hectares. So this is something of scale. It's not something pilot. This is scale. In Rapa, developed all these techniques over 30 years, so this is well demonstrated, and this is a win-win solution to oriented policy. Win-win because it increases productivity profits and it reduces tremendously emissions. The targets are very ambitious. By 2020, the summation of these six technologies, over 20,000 uh, individual farms, uh, will reduce emissions between 134 and 160. This is the target, and this is, of course, this is a government funded program. The loans are subsidized. Subsidy in the first three years is about $250, $300 million. So, this is the, what tax Brazil taxpayers are paying really to, to see that result. I'm very optimistic this will show a way for sustainable agriculture. This is at scale, it's not a small pilot project. So, in a few years, perhaps we should revisit this project. And from a social science or, or, or social equality point of view, it would be very interesting to see this. all these programs are also benefiting the small, uh, small holder. Not only it's a, it's a subsidy, it's helping, but whether really, because all of us want to be like, you know, we were recently in New Zealand. New Zealand is wonderful, and it's a middle class country. And it's fantastic. You don't see the inequalities so can we really get these people out of poverty with that? I think that has to be answered. I'm not saying we cannot, but I, I think we have to answer that before embarking only on that. And, uh, and finally, I want just to bring this issue. Uh, we've been proposing here in Brazil for a number of years that the real potential, phenomenal potential, and the future, in my opinion, of the tropical forest of the planet is, is a new economy. It's a biodiversity-based economy. It's a forest, standing forest-based economy, but mostly related to biodiversity. I mean, if you have this tremendous millions of species, why not some of those species would have tremendous economic effect? And I, I don't want to say theoretically, I want to give you this but this is real. This is the example of acai for those who are, those who are foreigners visiting Rio. Please go to any uh, uh, snack there, restaurant, and ask for acai. It's fantastic. Acai is a palm fruit, you can see there. 
traditionally a food stick for the Amazonians for hundreds of years. But now, in the last 15 years, exploded the international markets as a niche market. However, even a global niche market has tremendous economic importance. So acai uh, is about $2.5 billion a year. It's equal to timber, legal, illegal timber of the Brazilian Amazon, only second to beef, which is about $7 billion. So acai, in 15 years, it becomes something of $100, $150 million a year, local, and now it's international. There are a number of products not only food, now they found in Brapa, discovered that acai is a very good, non-toxic, natural dye indicator for dental plaque. It's being patented and it's going to reach the market. More important is social. Acai's uh, income for the, the growers, the producers of acai, it, it has a profit of between 200 and 2,000 dollars per hectare per year. This is far superior compared to cattle, compared to soy, and compared to timber. So this is tremendous value. And this is all well documented scientifically uh, that this is not something of a, a future distant project. This is well known. However, and this uh, uh, Brazilian uh, professor at the University of Indiana, he's done, Eduardo Bonis, he's done a lot of research for 20 years about acai. This is an uh, exhibit at the University of Indiana, all of the acai products, most of them have been developed outside of Brazil, showing that value adding is complicated, you need science, you need technology, you need capacity, but you have to have all those elements, otherwise tropical countries become producers of commodities, and they never add value, they never create good jobs. However, the other side of the acai story, the HDI, although I fully agree with my uh, my colleague, I say colleague because uh, Pais de Barros, he said I'm a social scientist, but we are, we, both of us, were colleagues, engineers. So both of us are in engineers by background. I went from a, a natural science to social science, but we, we have a training, I an electronics engineer, he as a mechanical engineer. Uh, so, he showed that beautiful progress, social progress, Brazil was attaining the HDI indices, but still, if you look at the main acai producing area in the Amazon, the Marajó Island, this area, these municipalities, you see still values 0.5. So it's still very poor. You can see some pictures from the acai producing villages and, and towns. Uh, and then, because this becomes a commodity, there is a lot of demand, uh, social services, uh, health vulnerability, pollution is felt up. Very close where concrete, concrete solutions are demanded. This is a very serious problem. So another way of looking at that is uh, if you look at the, the whole economy sectors, this is 21% in the Marajo Island is acai economy, which is altogether for the Amazon is $2.5 billion. And uh, uh, conditional cash transfers from governments or Bolsa Familia is that and more, many more with requirement already by the Barros mentioned that issue that elderly people in Brazil they receive a lot of benefits. So most of the economy is government transfers. It's not acai. How to turn that around? How to make acai and any biodiversity product uh, really uh, the, the main generator of income, jobs, and well-being in those areas? So let me, I'm almost finished. I just want to finalize highlighting a proposal. This academy here, Brazilian Academy of Science, Construct 2009. So, white paper in the, in the academy posed the following question: How to develop the Amazon sustainably? What's the scientific, technological requirements? And uh, uh, late Professor 
came to see the doctors for their protection. He seized earlier, or no, last year, yeah. last year. She coined that sentence that I use a lot to add value to the heart of the forest. And, and the, these documents by the Academy, really, it calls for a scientific revolution, a technological revolution. So it's not incremental. It has to be a, a, a breakdown. It has to be a departure from incremental, incrementally trying to develop. I know this is a concept that economists do not go along. We have had a lot of discussions with economists. But basically, that... Um, that document had three interrelated uh, revolutions. One, uh, science and technology must offer, but when we are looking from the perspective of the Academy of Science, we're looking very much how, how science and technology can help in the transition, how science can build sustainable, sustainability policies. It's one angle, but it's not all angles, it's one angle view. But anyway, science and technology must offer solutions for the emergence of innovative local bio-industry. Bio-industry. So it's not traditional agriculture anymore. It's an innovative, new, like the acai example. Uh, it's not there, but there is one suggestion, a revolution in, in communications. And Professor Pingeli, uh, someone else mentioned that the indigenous people in the morning, Professor David Dolich. They, they went in the, in the National Conference of Science Technology 2010. They said, we need, we need, uh, I'm, I'm finalizing. Uh, uh, we need, we need internet. And this is one element here, I'm going to show one more slide. However, the most difficult one, there are good elements of the emergence of this bio industry pilot projects, uh, but the most important one in my opinion is how to change the situation in terms of empowerment of the Amazonian population. So this empowerment and mass education of the forest people. This is really the major challenge, one that I don't think we have easy solutions. The more technological part, uh, Brazil is going to launch 2016 uh, broadband internet access satellites. Uh, very cheap and expensive, and expensive internet broadband to remote communities. So that will answer uh, the request by the indigenous population, all remote population in the Amazon, uh, in addition to a fiber optics running along the Amazon River, connecting all the river right populations, and also there is the emergence of some of these technical parks. Uh, uh, and uh, so, basically, this is one element, but of course we need all the, the revolutions, not only the technological one, we need the educational revolution. And, uh, and finally, this is my last slide, I just want to say, uh, you know, also, uh, I think a, a lot of people uh, study scientists, students study the Amazon, they are also moved by passion, by curiosity, by also by beauty. So beauty is also very important driver of our ambitions to understand the complexities of the beautiful biological system. However, given the anthropogenic drivers of change in the Amazon, Amazonian scientists, we also have to be moved by social responsibility. And sometimes we have to become what I term responsible advocates for sustainable development. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, I know everybody's tired, and I'm the main obstacle between you and Caipirinhas, so I'm going to try to be as quick as possible. And uh, before going into whatever I'm going to be talking about, let me show you my passion. This is, uh, this is the Milky Way. And uh, this is a photograph taken from the Andes in the southern hemisphere. And uh, for those of us who live in the north, there are a couple of uh, small galaxies here that are not seen in the north. These are the Magellanic clouds for 
all the solar hemisphere uh, natives, these are probably things that are there since the, the early uh, life. And um, that, you know, when, when this photograph was taken, there was a comet. So this is not Photoshop. So this is a beautiful picture of, uh, uh, you know, this uh, beautiful astronomical site. And I think that aside from quantum mechanics, you know, people doing social science should learn a little bit of astronomy and cosmology. Okay. Anyway, so um, I'm going to be talking about uh, another endangered ecosystem, which is the, the, the scientific ecosystem in Mexico. And uh, I was asked to talk about uh, science and decision makers and to be talking about the the case of Mexico is talking about a bad case yeah. of, you know, uh, what uh, policymakers do in Latin America. And uh, let me quickly go through this uh, slides. And uh, we all know that scientific information uh, is a vital component of the evidence required for societies to make effective decisions in particular uh, policy decision. And in Mexico, as in many places in Latin America, not necessarily in Brazil, but probably in the rest of Latin America, there has been a divorce between scientists and decision makers. Decision makers at the two levels. Government decision makers and private decision makers. And uh, one has to differentiate between the role played by social scientists and the one played by the rest of the scientific community. You know, social scientists, particularly economists, sociologists, and lawyers, have been always key advisors to decision makers at the two levels. Okay, but this has not been true for the rest of the sciences in Latin America. And um, this has uh, had a, a very strong negative impact in the ecosystem of science because, uh, you know, having a good relationship with the ones who are providing the, the money, it's very important. And uh, we had a, a very bad relationship over, I don't know, uh, 20, 30, uh, almost 40 years now, and the worst time in which we have bad relationship was in the last 20 years, okay? And, um, the, you know, the, the lowest point was reached uh, between 2000 and 2010, more or less. And, uh, well, you know, the, there are a lot of indicators that reach their worst values in Mexico, and I'm sure that in many uh, places in Latin America during that decade. And the technological trade balance reached its worst point in 2009. I'm going to show you some, some uh, new graphs for that. So the scientific community have had no political, social, or economic impact in Mexico, unfortunately. And uh, the, the, the science uh, and technology budget has been less than 0.5 of the gross national product gross domestic product for about four decades now. So it has been, you know, very constant. And with that very low investment, the impact in the growth of the scientific community has been very, very negative. And uh, so um, one of the, one of the uh, uh, byproducts of this bad relationship is that there has been almost no relationship universities and research uh, institutes with the productive sectors, which has had also a very negative impact in the economy of the economy. And uh, so the science, technology, and innovation community is, uh, is very small. We have some 45,000 researchers in all fields, and most of them are in the science community. There's a small fraction of them 
in the technological community and the innovation community is almost non-existent. Okay, and uh, the growth of the scientific community is very, very slow. For instance, uh, we have been graduating between 2,000 and 3,000 PhDs every year in Mexico. For comparison, Brazil is uh, graduating about 10,000 PhD per year, and the U.S. is uh, graduating about 50,000 PhD per year. So, uh, in one year, the U.S. can create the whole system in Mexico, existing in Mexico, uh, doing research, and uh, the low investment has prevented the system from from growing. And uh, we're, if we take, I don't know, the, the, the population as a reference or the gross domestic product as a reference, we have a deficit of the factor between five and 10 with respect to almost any other. Okay, so we have a small, a very small army in order to confront the challenges of the field. And the uh, research capabilities in Mexico, both human and physical, are mainly concentrated in public universities and in public institutional research. The, the private sector contributes with almost none in these two, in these two areas. Uh, private universities do not do uh, research, or they do a, a very small amount of research and they do it in areas that they don't need to invest. For instance, in math or social sciences or, or some of the areas that do not need strong investment. So forget about physics, chemistry, biology, and all these areas that require a lot of investment. And uh, well, as I said, the investment has been very small. Fortunately, it's growing within the last two years. Okay, this is something that probably most of you know, and this is uh, the correlation between the, the, the investment in science and technology. This, this thing doesn't show much. Okay, you see it here? Okay. Yeah, so the, this is the, the investment uh, in, in science and technology as a, as a fraction of the gross uh, domestic product. Uh, versus the, the, the growth domestic product per capita for all the OCD countries, okay? Uh, there, uh, there's a very clear correlation that the stronger or the higher the, the, the investment, the best the revenue that you get for the economy. There are a couple of uh, outliers here. Uh, this is uh, Luxembourg has a very small number of people, so it departs uh, really uh, far from, from the main thread. And Norway, Norway has a very efficient uh, uh, scientific system. And here are uh, a, a few countries, this is uh, South Korea and Israel, who are the ones who have been investing the most in recent years. They want to they wanna, uh, create a uh, a system in which their economies can move in this in this direction. Okay, but here one can see the economic benefits of making this uh, type of investment, and uh, Mexico is now in the This is Mexico. This is one of the the lagging uh, countries, and uh, here here you can see the the the, the expenditure. Uh, that we have in, in the countries of uh, the OCDE, Mexico is right here, and you can see that compared with the, with the other countries, or the, the leading countries were a factor of 10, almost 10 below the investment that is required. And this is the, the average for OCDE countries, which is about 2.4% the gross national product. Okay, so that should be the target for the countries nowadays. Okay.
okay? And we're still far from the 1%, okay? And uh, this is a consequence of that. Here you can see the number of researchers per thousand employees in Mexico. Oops. Mexico is right here. And uh, in, in, in pink, you can see the fraction of people who have been hired by the productive sector. In blue, it's government and educational uh, groups. And you can see that the leading countries have a very large fraction of people hired from the productive sector, suspected because most of, the, most of the investment in these countries is coming from the private sector, not from the government. For instance, in, in Korea, about 80% of the investment is coming from the private sector, and only 20% from uh, the government. And uh, this is another result of you know, this very low investment. This is the performance in math, uh, reading in science, the PISA uh, results, and Mexico again is down here. It's uh, with the lowest performance uh, in, in, in this test. And, and you can see, that, you know, the green is bad, the, 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 the orange is reading, and the purple is science. And all of them are correlated. And what, you know, the countries that are here, are countries in which people or young people know how to read, but they do not understand what they are doing. So that's uh, one of the key consequences here. Okay, and this is the the the, the trade balance uh, for technological products, and um, we can see here that in Mexico in 2009 we had a negative trade. Uh, 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 balance that was forty billion dollars. Okay, so we were investing forty billion dollars in technological goods. Uh, we were paying other countries to do research and development. Okay? And, uh, the, the investment in Mexico was less than ten percent of that. <laughs> okay, uh, and here, well, this is. Uh, uh, again, something really depressing. This is the triadic uh, patent families. This means patents that are put in the U.S., in Europe, and in Japan at the same time. And uh, these are the, the countries of OCDE. And Mexico is right there. You cannot see it. <laughs> okay. So, so this is uh, this you know goes in line with the deficit in technological uh, goods uh, in Mexico. So here is the big challenge for Mexico in Latin America. Here what we have is the, 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 the investment in science and technology versus the investment of science and technology from the private sector. Okay, and these are uh, the OCE countries and Latin America is right here. So we're not investing, and basically the lack of investment is coming from the productive sector. The private sector in our countries is not investing in developing innovation. Okay? So this is the, the weakest point we have. Okay, so just to finalize, uh, in the last couple of years, th things have changed a little bit in Mexico. The new, we have a new uh, government administration uh, that started office in 2012, and they have been committed ever since to increase the, the, the investment and to create a much better, a larger ecosystem uh, for science and technology, particularly in the uh, innovation area. And actually, this is the first time, this is unusual, that a government has hired a science advisor to the president's office. Okay, so this shows that there is a, there is a, a, a will uh, 
in this new world. Also, the relationship with the legislators has improved uh, enormously in the last few years. And we have been doing several things with them. We have been uh, putting a number of joint seminars about several topics. Uh, we, uh, from the Academy of Science in Mexico, we made two workshops uh, associated with climate change in the, in the last year, and we also did one workshop on open access. And uh, well, we have several, uh, several projects with them, and hopefully things are going to be moving in the direction that the university industry might be doing better in the, next, in the next few years. But the key remaining problem, obviously, is the private investment in research and development. So I'm going to stop here, guys, so we can go to look for a better future. <laughs> um, policy state initiatives. But this one moratorium was uh, renewed now for one more year. And what do you think of uh, its importance in terms of uh, the reduction of deforestation? And, uh, well, I had a question for Gabriel, not here. Because, uh, well, anyway, he put, uh, he spoke about, I think it's interesting to, to comment, from my point of view, <laughs> that uh, the new paradigm he was proposing uh, he mentioned uh, the underlying uh, uh, drivers, but he put uh, people as the last one. So if we are not trying to you know, establish this uh, dialogue, uh, I think that it's important to understand uh, the role of society and of people in a more crucial level. Uh, not to add people, not to add society, but how uh, nature is being transformed by certain social practices, certain economic practices, and as well uh, everyday practices, you know, that are not uh, being mentioned in uh, representations uh, of this session. So uh, to uh, Gordon, I would like to ask, uh, how do you see in all these um, structures that you mentioned, IRD, ISDR, WCDR, well, all those uh, acronyms, uh, what, um, how, is, uh, how do you see the, uh, the presupposition that, uh, uh, about what is society? Uh, what is, uh, as uh, um, Alicia Abreu spoke uh, about uh, social agency, no, in her presentation, what do you think about uh, the role of social agency in this report, in this analysis? Because the situation is not only data, no, the, uh, or to collect data. We need also that uh, people change their attitudes uh, in relation to climate change in their everyday practices. Now we saw uh, a crowd in New York streets uh, that was uh, an impact for also the organizers, how many people, but how many of us are changing our everyday practices? And that's important. We are speaking about the state, the market, but uh, some people, Consumers, <coughs> the term of consumers didn't show up, I think. And we are uh, also citizens and consumers. So which is uh, the role of consumers and uh, citizens, let's say, in, the, the, and the, uh, in this uh, report? How do you see that in this? As you mentioned that you have a social background. Or uh, <laughs> I'm opening. Okay, uh, maybe you want to ask now? There you go. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
important and I try and maybe link the first question about science valued by society but also the whole question of, of people and how I, I think we as scientists and I include social scientists in that word uh, uh, need to do a very much better job, job of communicating to, uh, to, to policy makers but probably even more importantly to the media to the general public um, just I often ask the question when I'm sitting in front of scientists, okay, how many of you guys actually talked to the media in the last month? If they phone you, do you, do you return the call? Uh, or how many of you actually have given a, a public presentation to a high school class or a rotary club or an old age citizens group? And most of them, first of all, would say they wouldn't even be bothered doing any of those things. And secondly, they haven't done it. I've done all of those in the last... I was on our national television on on for climate change day. Uh, recorded it before I was in Paris, but I was it was, it was anyway. Uh, and I think it's important that we as scientists, first of all, do a better job of communicating, and we probably need to have training in doing that, which is another role of I guess a social scientist. I mean, I have a colleague who's a media consultant. And uh, I know he charges a fortune when he does it for political parties and all that kind of thing. But when I call him up and say, hey, you know, can I fly you down to my university town to give a two-hour seminar? How do you talk to the media? He says, sure, I'll do it, just for the cost of the air fare. No consulting fees, anything. I pay his travel costs. But, and I think we need to take advantage of people like that. I'm sure there are many others around in parts of the world who can help us as scientists learn how to better communicate. Because I found it invaluable when I was, quite frankly, even told I had to take training from this guy 20 years ago. I said, I don't need training. I'm a professor. I know how to talk to the media. And he said, no, you don't. Try this guy. And I found him really good. This is an example. So I think we need to do a better job. And I think part of that is, is finding ways through these communication processes of informing people of the value of science, social and natural and engineering and economic and all those things, so that people understand better, because certainly my interaction with politicians, and mostly in Canada, is that they are interested in what, uh, some of them are interested in what I say to them, but they're more interested in knowing what the public thinks we're going to vote or not for them in the next election. And we've got to get them those people out there to make it clear to the politicians that 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 they ha- they want to see more support. So those numbers that were shown on when I was noting to Heidi in one of the diagrams we put right near the end that one of the few not places where the investment in science had gone down was Canada. And I know that's the case, but you know the question is why? Why can't? Why does the government? not do that anymore and that's the way. so we need to quite frankly work with media work with community groups with civil social agencies whatever you want to call them in order to help them to help us because I think we, need, we can make the better case for us and we need to think that through and that's one of the things I see is the role of the Council of Science working with the Social Science Council and others is that better communicating and quite frankly providing our communities around the world with guidance, information, numbers that can help make the case. Some of the things you show, for example, would be ideal to show people when you look up the numbers for Korea or, and so on, to uh, use those as arguments as to why we need to make these investments in science of all kinds. Thanks. I'll stop now that one of the colleagues continue. In the case of Mexico, I think, uh, well, there are several reasons why this has been happening. But one of uh, the, the, the key points in history is the NACTA, the, the trade agreement between Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. Um, for, for some reasons, you know, macroeconomics has been uh, driving the, the economy in Mexico, and uh, we are the 14th uh, economy. 
economy in the world. So we're not a poor country. We're actually a very rich country. But we behave as a very poor country. And um, uh, one of the, the key parts is that uh, with the trade agreement, uh, a lot of products have been coming from the U.S. and in Canada within the last 30 years. And uh, this has killed the inventive and the initiative in Mexico because, you know, the, 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 the small uh, businesses or the small companies that were, you know, having a hard time trying to survive, they were, they were wiped out with the, with the trade agreement. And uh, as, a, as a result, uh, you know, Mexico has been uh, receiving a lot of money from elsewhere mainly the U.S. and Europe and uh, not, not so much from Canada but mainly from the U.S. In, in Europe and uh, these investments have created uh, you know that international uh, uh, companies are based in Mexico for cheap labor so we have been basing cheap labor and they have improved you know the, 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 the system that uh, allows uh, youngsters to be trained for, you know, being good workers, but not for making the sign. So, you know, the inventive of Mexicans is not used at all by all these countries. So, you know, this this is the result of, I think, bad economic uh, 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 policies. I'm not blaming the economists for this, but obviously there is, a, uh, or there, there has been, uh, a policy focus on the market and not on the development of the country. So Mexico has been putting, you know, in the front row, the market and the possibilities of uh, selling things to the world without creating the goods inside of Mexico. And um, so the, the the market might be might be a good. Uh, a good driver for some things, but it's not a good driver for making science, technology, and innovation if you want to do it within the country. I don't know if that answers your, your question. I will just address uh, Julia's question uh, in two parts. Let's compare the very successful uh, Greenpeace campaign for the soil, for the soya moratorium, it was led by, driven by Greenpeace, by and large, coalition of NGOs, but very successful. They were able to instill fear in the trading companies of soil that they would damage their image in Europe mostly, but internationally. And, you know, for the companies, really, it did not make much of a difference because the companies they profit a lot from selling technology. They are they sell the full package, these trading companies. They they don't only trade soya in the international market, but they sell the full package to the growers, to the producers, the seeds, etc. etc. the technology, etc. etc. So, you know, for them in fact, I mean if they can produce uh, use more technology, it does not matter whether it's a newly deforested area or the old deforestation. So, uh, but of course, you know, Greenpeace is powerful and uh, they were effective. On the other hand, Greenpeace was not very effective in, in the Arctic. Although they, s they seized the, the, the Russian uh, you know, the ship there doing the drilling, uh, the Russians arrested all those Greenpeace people, etc. Because, because you know, if they try to do a uh, Russian oil or gas moratorium in Europe, it's not going to work. So I think this interesting comparison here. Why is that so? I don't understand. You social scientists should explain that. To me. Why oil and gas moratoriums, for instance, would not work? At least not for for Russian oil and gas. However, it, it has had a very uh, pedagogical effect because the area that eventually, without the moratorium, the soya would advance on the forest in the northern, uh, but across the southern Amazon, is really very small. 
However, the moratorium has really demonstrated that uh, uh, you have to act vertically in agriculture. That means intensification. Crop intensification, the, all the, the, these people, they know, the, the, the scientists in the area, they say, they know. So crop intensification is the answer. Soya is the same. So I think this almost 10 year moratorium, which I think it will be extended, uh, serves as a long term ex experiment to demonstrate that vertical intensification is the answer to Latin American agriculture, particularly tropical portions of Latin America. The other part, you did not bring up the, in your question, but I think it's more important than the soil moratorium as really a deterrent to illegal deforestation is the agreement between how do I say that in English? The district, district attorney that's it, right? But the lawyers, the government lawyers, the, the procuradores, the Ministério Público, in Pará, with all the big meat producers, not, not the farmers, but the meat packagers, Friboi, JWS, I think this is really important because they made the agreement, traceability of beef chain, and all those. They were very concerned because they, they could be sent, sent to jail because this is really illegal deforestation. I mean, the, the, this cattle is being raised 90% of the times in areas which have been illegally deforested. And so the uh, government attorneys, they were very effective. This is four, five year continuous process in which they brought all these meat packagers the meat companies, big ones, like JBS, the largest meat company in the world. And they brought these people over and over to meetings and they made very clear to, to them that either they would have traceability of the meat chain or eventually they would really wreak havoc to their business. They would put the director, the, the CEO of the company in jail and these people paid attention to that because they knew these attorneys were very serious, uncorrupted. So that has been, has had a very important message. The message, the, the, the sector is, you know, let's not move into illegal deforestation because eventually we are going to be caught. So I think that this, of course, this is one, it's a government-induced policy through curbing illegal deforestation, the attorneys. The other one is completely spontaneous private sector, NGO private sector arrangement. Both of them are working. And uh, of course the one private is much cheaper to government because it was arranged privately. Uh, but I, uh, because soil, uh, soil uh, driven deforestation is much less than, it's about 15% historically, 10, 12% in fact. Uh, cattle raising driven deforestation is 75%. So acting on curbing illegality in the in the meat chain is really the way to go. May, may I make a comment? And I think that on, on this even, the communication has reached society because now Free Boy and GPS are hammering people in television about how you have to consume traceable meat. Yeah. And I think what you said at the end of the communication issue, in this case, is working very well. I would read the discussion with Pepe. Think. Uh, you have been made a good use, and I think we need to provide more from each one, in the question of pizza through the question of priority of mathematics. Because I remember Jose Antonio, your colleague, has been very strong, and he continued being a very strong. So I think it's so, it's relevant. In that issue of mathematics, not only can help the region, which is what we are really doing, but I think we can do more. Particularly, we are, we are all sort of uh, natural science, but we haven't really, in 
find in ancient science people on that. We forget about that sci uh, education is a science within the ASC. And we need to really use them, especially comparing with Korea, Catherine. You're, when you were showing Korea, I was thinking, oh my God, we haven't really asked the question of teaching mathematics for teachers, not only for scientists who work on mathematics, to be much more sort of work on that. And that can really help, can help Mexico and thank Mexico for having the office here. Thank you. Well, thanks, Dr. William. Um, we have been going against the stream for the last uh, 10 years, uh, easily, at the Academy of Sciences, and we're hosting both ICSU and Yanis uh, at the Academy of Sciences in Mexico. And that has, you know, helped us to lever up the, the, the position of uh, science and technology in the media with the public, and finally, with the policy and decision makers. And um, uh, so we have been working in several projects uh, associated with uh, uh, science education in Mexico. Uh, one of the main problems that we face is that the teachers, particularly at the primary and secondary level, know nothing about science. They don't care about science and they cannot transmit any science to the, to the students. So we have been, uh, uh, we created a program to provide training on both science and math to teachers for the primary and secondary level. And we have been quite successful at the small, small numbers, but really quite successful with these numbers. And the, the program, has been uh, not only improved within Mexico, but now we're exporting that program to several countries in both Central America and the Caribbean. So we have uh, about nine countries who are following our, our program of education for primary uh, school and secondary school. Anyway, um, so we're really aware of what you're saying and we're working in that direction. Well, maybe the last question or comment, please? Uh, question and answer? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, that would be great. Yes, maybe question and answer. Um, because you have been talking about uh, science communication and the importance of science communication. And um, I could say, as, uh, uh, as being somehow part of the community of science communicators in Latin America that uh, this community has been growing steadily uh, for the past you know, few decades and in Mexico too. Um, so in, in this respect, we are okay, but this is just one dimension of the problem. I was thinking of something you said about NAFTA. Now, because science communicators don't engage a lot uh, with the science policy. Many times we are told, and we have been told in this, um, during this meeting, that uh, it's important to communicate uh, the contents of science, but not so much about the, the problems of science policy. So my suggestion would be, for example, if you consider part of the Mexican Academy of Sciences that NAFTA has been uh, has had a bad impact on, on science, technology, and innovation in Mexico. Why don't you produce some kind of report? You work on this hypothesis. You, I mean, you, you, you research on this hypothesis, and then you circulate this as a as a as a way uh, of impacting on uh, macroeconomic policies. If you consider as as a member of the scientific community, that these microeconomic policies have been deleterious to science, technology, and economy, and the impact of science, technology, and innovation on the economy in Mexico. And then science communicators will discuss it and you know, put it on their public agenda. Yeah. 
Yeah, the role of NAFTA is um, uh, has been put on the table by industrial groups. See, they have been complaining that they have lost uh, uh, the possibility of creating goods inside Mexico that they prefer to import because it's cheaper for them to import them and then you know, do the, 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 the commerce uh, within, within Mexico. So it has not been our issue. See, I'm, I'm just uh, putting on the table this thing that has been very important for industrial groups. There is another thing that is probably uh, for our case more important, which is, uh, you know, oil revenues in Mexico has been used uh, freely and it has, uh, you know, uh, uh, raised the economy in Mexico in science and technology. Actually, uh, it, 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 it sounds kind of ridiculous, but uh, the, 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 the chemical industry associated with petroleum and all hydrocarbons uh, was dismantled something like 20 years ago. 